Warm welcome to the program and Millicent Walker in Lagos. It's day 232 since Russia invaded Ukraine. Here are the developments today. The United Nations General Assembly overwhelmingly condemned Russia's attempted illegal annexation of four partially occupied regions in Ukraine. 143 countries voted in favor of a resolution that also reaffirmed the sovereignty, independence, unity territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Only four countries joined Russia in voting against the resolution, namely Syria, Nicaragua, North Korea and Belarus. Another 35 countries abstained from the vote, including Russia's st strategic partner China, while the rest did not vote. The machine. We just witnessed a very important, perhaps I, I even, even say historic moment in the General Assembly in the 21st century. 143 votes, it's amazing. What is not amazing, what is very bad for Russia, that only four countries are on the right side of history. I think that the countries made the right choice to defend the principles of the United Nations Charter. I was not surprised, but I was delighted uh, to see uh, the numbers. We were all holding our breaths as the numbers uh, rolled in. And it's a strong, strong signal to the world and to Russia that they cannot intimidate the world. They thought that they could call for a secret ballot and that somehow a secret ballot would get them more more votes and they were defeated in their efforts uh, to work against transparency. So again, this is a message to Russia. It's a message from the world that they need to cease their aggression against Ukraine. The head of Ukraine state nuclear energy company today decried as fake news Russian assertions that the Moscow-controlled Zaporizhia nuclear power plant will need Russian fuel. And uh, Guatam chief Petro Cotton speaking in an interview said there are fresh fuel supplies and storage at the sixth reactor plant, the largest in Europe. His comments came after an official of Rosenegatom, Russia's nuclear power operator, was quoted by Russia's TASS state news agency as saying that these apparition plants would be switched to Russian fuel once its reserves are exhausted. Ukraine and Russia have repeatedly accused each other of shelling the facility, raising fears of a mishap that could release radioactive material. Kotin said his biggest fear was a cut-off of external power needed for cooling the reactors, all of which are in cold, the shutdown and a loss of emergency diesel generators that have only 10 days of supplies of fuel, threatening a meltdown. According to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, Moscow must be made to comply with demands by the UN nuclear watch, watchdog to allow the full demilitarization of the Russian-occupied Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. He made his comments in a video address to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, Europe's leading human rights watchdog. International Atomic Energy Agency IAEA chief Rafael Grossi has visited Kyiv and St. Petersburg in recent days in an attempt to get a demilitarized zone agreed. Following a meeting with President Vladimir Putin, Grossi said Wednesday that he was returning to Kyiv for more talks. Meanwhile, President Rodemir Zelensky said Ukraine has only about 10% of what it needs for its air defenses and ruled out diplomatic contact with Russia. Mrs. Zelensky made the comments while addressing the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe via video link. He said that Russia must be diplomatically isolated so that Russian society would start pressuring the military and political leadership in Moscow. He also agreed, or rather urged, the Red Cross to press Russia on allowing access to Ukraine's prisoners of war. Since Monday's strikes by Russia, Germany has sent the first of four planned IRIS-T air defense systems, while Washington said it would speed up delivery of promised NASAM's air defense system. 
And talking about Germany, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz underscored the implications of the war in Ukraine for the West in a speech today, calling it part of a crusade by Russia against liberal democracy. In a recorded speech at the Progressive Governance Summit in Berlin, Mr. Scholz spoke in English and said that Russia's conflict with Ukraine was part of a wider crusade against what the Russian president calls the collective West. Mr. Scholz further deemed the differences between his ruling coalition's parties, the Social Democrats, Greens and Liberals, as insignificant in light of measuring them against the democratic, liberal and progressive values they hold in common. Most recently, disagreements arose in the government regarding the debate on how to deal with the energy crisis which was fueled by Russia's war of aggression. Und ganz wichtig, wir sparen Kosten mit der Beschaffung durch die Nutzung von Skaleneffekten. Well, in the meantime, the United States has reaffirmed its commitment to defend every inch of NATO territory ahead of talks among defense ministers from the alliance that will include closed-door discussions by its nuclear planning group. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin made the remarks affirming America's commitment to NATO's collective defense following repeated nuclear threats by Russian presidents amid battlefield setbacks in his nearly eight-month-long invasion of Ukraine. Um, I also agree with you on, uh, on the fact that we're going to stay with uh, our efforts to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. Uh, and you've heard us say that over and over again. The other thing that you've heard us say over and over again is that the United States is absolutely committed to its Article 5 commitments, and we are committed to defending every inch of NATO's territory uh, if and when it comes to that. Um, uh, the very strong message from the international community uh, yesterday. The vote in the UN was a clear condemnation of the illegal annexation of Ukrainian territories and a clear call on Russia, President Putin, to uh, reverse these decisions and to respect the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Talk so, some more about those developments there. Uh, Mr. John S. is a lawyer and counterterrorism expert. He joins me now from London virtually. Thank you for joining me on the program. Uh, John, 143 countries voted in favor of the resolution reaffirming sovereignty, independence, and the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Um, but what's your take on the four countries who joined Russia in voting against the resolution? And that includes Syria, North Korea, Belarus, and Nicaragua. Uh, thank you for having me, Millicent. It's not uh, surprising if you are going to uh, bet on countries who will probably not agree with the rest of the international community. It will be those countries, uh, probably Iran and China, but I know China abstained. But it's a very strong message to Vladimir Putin that being the revisionist he is, he will not be allowed to, to alter the rules-based international order. That order has saved the world for the last 80 years is the reason we haven't had a world war like we had the first and the second world wars and what he's trying to do is reverse that order and take us back to prayers where we used to have world wars and it looks like the west is just beginning to come to terms to the fact that these are diametrically opposed independent and irreconcilable postures that it, putin is not going to change his ways he responds by escalating that is all he does. He escalates, and that is what he's going to continue to do. So I'm glad he's gotten this message, but I doubt that that is going to change anything. I think what might change in Russia, if, he's, if, if he is pushed to the brink and the Russians can see there's no way out, and they take him out, I think the, the high likelihood is that he'll be taken out in Russia itself, rather than it being maybe the NATO or the EU or any other international body for that matter. I think his own, within his own circle is going to be taken out because at some point they won't be able to afford him anymore.
And when you look at perhaps a list of the number of countries that abstained, um, were you surprised about um, China? And this is also um, when we look at, you know, the African countries, we understand that Mali, um, Central African Republic, Ethiopia, the Republic of Congo, South Africa, Sudan, Uganda and Zimbabwe were among uh, the African countries that abstained. Eritrea, which had previously voted to reject uh, the UN resolution uh, condemning Russia's invasion, also so abstained today? Uh, if you look at the, all of those countries you've just mentioned, at least most of them, Russia either has operational footprints or presence in those countries or is planning to, because it's, it's, uh, it's incrementally uh, uh, increasing its presence in Africa. And a lot of those con uh, countries you've mentioned are some of the, the countries that Putin is in. But said, with that said, uh, there's a lot of uh, international influence from other countries in those in those uh, countries as well. So they're looking for balance. They're trying to straddle the fence, uh, not annoy the West because they'll need help from the West, but not uh, uh, be overly uh, uh, demonstrable of its uh, if its opposition to Russia as well. So it's just like China is straddling the fence at the moment. But at some point, when uh, uh, Russia's fate is inevitable, they'll have to change their postures and align probably but at the moment all they're doing is trialing the fence because that's all they can do and you know for those wondering about nigeria um i think uh, the country has always been neutral um when it comes to to this um but let's talk about russia launching fresh attacks today ukrainian officials have said hitting a critical infrastructure facility and this is near kiev um, days ago, we heard that they're planning to hit more of their military and energy um, infrastructure. Um, do you think Putin is unrelenting with this new strategy we're seeing? And the UN has called it shocking because, you know, it appears to be going beyond the battle line into hitting civilians. Yeah, but it's not a new strategy from the 24th of October. This is uh, February, sorry, when this war began. This is what Putin has been doing. When he can't win on the battlefield, that's the only way he can get back at the Ukrainians and uh, accept his uh, his revenge. Uh, uh, several months ago, I think two, two, four, three, two or three months into the war, he had warned the West that if he kept supplying uh, uh, sophisticated uh, weaponry to Ukraine, that he was going to escalate the the his attacks. That's exactly what he's done. I know he's done it under the pretext that he's responding to it's a retaliatory response to the attack on the uh, Kerch Street Bridge a, a few days ago. But this is Putin. It, it, uh, what surprises me is he ought to know that the strategy he's pushing is a failed strategy, but he keeps recalibrating on it. He keeps doubling down on it, and he wants to negotiate as well. How can you want to negotiate when you keep doing the wrong things and you keep affecting the party you want to negotiate with? You know, that's why uh, Zelensky has hop, opted out of any negotiations with him. Because he, uh, Putin thinks one way, he never backs down. And he will keep recalibrating. He will keep doubling down on that strategy, even though it's not helping him. He can see that every time he takes a step, when the West responds, it takes him five steps backwards. The West is doubling down as well, because I think the West has realized because that this is how he is. But everyone has a breaking point. So the West is going to squeeze him. They're going to keep tightening the screws until he breaks. If he doesn't, the Russians who break first will take him out. So keep squeezing the West using Ukraine. Um, in terms of negotiations, doesn't that benefit Ukraine, seeing as its cities, its people decimated, are being killed, they're moving out of the ancestral homes? Who does negotiation benefit at this point? It will benefit Russia because it will be negotiating from a weaker position. It only yesterday, 50 countries uh, came to a, a multilateral consensus. 30 of those countries are NATO countries. Excuse me, committing to back Ukraine, you know, for the long haul. So Ukraine has all the backing. Uh, the air defense systems they've been asking for are just now arriving. So when that uh, when when they're set up. Ukraine will have a, a, a lot more capacity. You'll be able to operate freely with a, a lot more, with a higher degree of efficacy because they wouldn't be having to worry about uh, Putin targeting the civilian infra infrastructure 
and the Ukrainian constituents. So it benefits uh, 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 Zelensky far more than it does Putin. Putin only wants to negotiate now because he knows he's losing. And he only insists on negotiations when you're losing. I recall Zelensky asking for negotiations a few months ago, but Putin turned him, turned him down because he was on the up at the time. Now it's uh, Zelensky's uh, turn to, to turn him down. So in terms of where we are uh, on the battlefield, on the front lines with this war, um, you know, comments from NATO-led allies saying that they're going to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. Does this uh, speak of a new phase of this war, which is what Russia has been warning against, Western influence, which might affect their reaction um, to this special operation, they've called it, in Ukraine? Yeah, uh, well, I, it's not necessarily a new phase. It, it's, it's been necessitated because of... Uh, uh, Putin's uh, attacks on, on civilian targets and on infrastructure. He's done this in the past, but this is the most brutal, uh, you know, and the most, it's, it's been indiscriminate. It's surprising that only, I think, 11 people died, under 20 anyway, given the scale and the scope. And uh, I think 100 casualties. You'd have expected a lot more, but, you know, thankfully, that, that is not the case. But I think the West has come to the realization that he's, he's going to continue doing this. You know, so the, every measure, necessary measure has to be taken to, and to, for him to know that he cannot get away with this. You know, the more he doubles down, the West will have to double down as well and provide uh, 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 Ukraine with all the help it, it needs. 50 countries is a lot. I think it's unprecedented for 50 countries to come together in, in one voice with a multilateral consensus to support one country, you know, to ensure it, it's a, a territorial integrity and uh, and the sovereignty. That will give uh, uh, Zelensky a lot of hope uh, going forward. But as soon as those systems are set up and uh, Ukrainian airspace can be defended uh, properly, then we'll see an uptick on Ukrainians, on the Ukrainian side, to keep pushing before the winter sets in. Because when winter sets in, then that will be another phase of the war because winter will, will constrain uh, uh, counter offensives, even counter attacks. So where the phase will change is when winter sets in. The war will carry on. It will be a different phase of the war because the tactics will be different and the strategies, the uh, medium-term strategies will be different as well. But this is just a continuation of what uh, uh, Putin has been doing. He's just, you know, increased the, the intensity, that's all. And in terms of, you know, the, the resolution in favor of Ukraine's inter territorial integrity, that's 143 countries. Um, let's take a look at what, uh, you know, Russia's president has called the bridge attack, terrorist attack, and also said that they've arrested a number of people, some of them Ukrainian, some Armenian, and interestingly, some of them are also Russians. Yeah. Well, there, I suspect there's an element of sabotage, which is why Putin feels really frustrated. This is not the first time Ukraine has gotten the better of the better of him. Uh, in the, in Kharkiv, it was the same thing. Uh, Zelensky lied to the whole world that he had designs on uh, uh, launching a, a counteroffensive in Kherson, and because. Uh, uh, Putin had made some incremental gains. He didn't want to lose the territorial gains in, in Kherson. So he pulled out troops that ought to have defended uh, Kharkiv and in other places to Kherson, uh, uh, took a lot of his, uh, deployed a lot of his heavy artillery to, to Kherson only to find out uh, that Zelensky was actually targeting uh, uh, Kharkiv. And to pull off a stunt like that, it, even at the best of times, is extremely difficult, you know, to be able to develop a target package of such uh, magnitude, uh, assemble, uh, uh, I think it was 20,000 soldiers. That is uh, uh, an equivalent of one uh, uh, NATO division. 20,000 soldiers into Kharkiv, where Russia has operational presence, but did not even detect what, what the Ukrainians were trying to do. And now the 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 cage uh, straight bridge in in on on the on in the Crimean Peninsula. Now that truck, the truck that had the the uh, explosions in it, explosives in it, what came from Russia? 
it made its way through the metal detectors at the bridge. And there was another truck filled with oil that was illegally parked just by the by where the thing blew up. So that the, the truck must have been there to maximize the, the impact of the explosion. And obviously Russians are involved. So I, I will, if I was put in, I would be worried because now if the war for Russia is not only in Ukraine, it's in Russia as well. So he'll have to, they'll have to start worrying where the next attack will be, whether it will be the Russians involved or whether any, even the location, will it be in Russia or will it be Ukraine? So he has a lot to worry about. We'll continue to watch the developments. We want to appreciate you for joining us at this time. Mr. John Essing is a lawyer and counterterrorism expert. Thanks again. Thank you for having me, Minister.